All right, whenever you want to roll. Hi everybody, it's Joe Conkley in the shop. Today we're going to take a look at this 1949 Gibson J45 project that I've been working on for a while. First, let me just uh, tell you what I've done so far and where I'm at. Let's just start at the top here, the tippy top. Uh, the first thing I did was to change out the tuners. Came in with these tuners on, which are um, not period correct and certainly thought of as inexpensive, you know, in their time, as opposed to uh, something that would be more appropriate on this instrument. These squarish buttons are kind of unique and weird. <laughs> and uh, that was the first clue that these were not appropriate. So I chose a set of uh, Golden Age replica tuners, three on a plate. The plate itself, with these little scallops on the top and the corners, um, is kind of a distinctive vintage look. They have the oval plastic buttons. You can see the uh, imprint of the previous tuner, this, uh, the ends there, but, uh, I will also take some time to put a little vintage touch on these stark white buttons, you know, basically just stain them. Um, and, uh, but they fit in beautifully. The uh, bushings that come with the golden age are these nice hex shaped ones, but I chose to use these original, or uh, I don't know, I think they are original. Uh, just uh, thin metal stamped bushings. They were already in there and looking pretty good. So that got me through that first little conundrum. <clears throat> and we were looking at this crack right here, a previously repaired headstock crack that was still holding up quite well, but there was a tiny gap on the outside edge, it was starting to move again from string tension. And so I was able to get some glue in there and uh, make sure it was nice and solid. And uh, after buffing it a little bit, there was, uh, as occurs many times when you buff a finish, the buffing compound tends to find its way into all the little cracks and crevices and turn white in a day or two so that you have this really stark, you know, eye catching thing that takes you right to the crack that you're trying to hide. So I was able to get, uh, basically what I used in that crack was some, uh, grain filler stuff that would go into these little darker marks in the grain in, in, in part of the finishing process long before you put the finish on top of it. But that, uh, Filled in that little edge, darkened it up, and the, the peghead crack is very solid. So then I went to the body of the instrument, and the first thing I did was deal with the bridge. A nice uh, Brazilian rosewood, original bridge, but for some reason, the um, bridge was put on a little further back than it was originally at some point. I really couldn't figure out and tried to speculate how this happened because the bridge was kind of in the middle of this footprint here. It was not all the way to this back edge. You can see this dark edge right here, which this uh, little area was bare wood. Um, and this nice clean line in the front, the bridge was sitting back from that. So kind of in the middle of this footprint right here. Uh, so I had to do finish touch up on both sides of the bridge. So basically I took uh, some uh, very hot um, lacquer solvent called butyl salisolve, and it's described as hot because it does um, melt into the finish a little bit better than regular uh, lacquer thinner. And the main thing, the main way it does that 
is that it, uh, I don't know if it's the main way, but one way that it does that is that it uh, has a very slow drying time. Uh, regular uh, lacquer thinner will evaporate very quick and gas off. This stuff is very slow, so as it sits there slowly, it tends to melt into the finish more and allows new finish to bite in to the old finish and adhere really well. And also it allows you then to sort of minimize that line between new finish and old finish. Anyhow, and uh, it's very difficult to make that line disappear, but I'm pretty happy with the way that turned out. So once I got that done, I was able then to put the bridge down where I want and where I wanted it was such that uh, the intonation would work out, you know, so that the uh, saddle slot is where I wanted the scale length plus a little compensation factor, you know, on both sides. And uh, able to put that, re-glue that bridge on there after I did the finish work. Um, had to do something in the interior to, um, to make that work. Let's see if we can take a look at that. Think we can get an interior shot here, huh? Yeah, I think so. All right, so we got a light there. And most of the time what this depends on is the person's perspective who's holding the mirror. And <laughs> I will, I can see that right now. So maybe if we can get the camera over. So you can see there's the bridge plate underneath the bridge. And on top of that bridge plate is a very small, what I would call bridge plate patch which is a little rectangular piece of maple that covers the pinholes. And uh, because of that movement of the bridge, you know, back and forth within that footprint somehow, those holes were enlarged and the holes that I needed to, where I needed them to be to get this bridge placed properly, they were uh, all wallered out as they say. And so um, I put that bridge plate patch in there. It is approximately 50 thousandths thick, which is about half as thick as a normal bridge plate. And so there's very little mass or weight there being added to the top. That allowed me then to use a combination of uh, super glue and sawdust to fill the holes from the top here because that that uh, medium just set right on that uh, bridge plate patch, redrill the holes where they need to be, and it's all nice and firm and uh, uh, solid. And so I got that going, put the bridge back down where it needs to be, and, and also kept the, uh, you saw on the inside, those two bolts that go right underneath mm -hmm. the uh, um, pearl dots there. Um, in general, I have always viewed uh, uh, any metal in the bridge area to be uh, overkill and adding mass and weight to the center part of the, you know, one of the most important parts of the, uh, the sound of the guitar, the top, especially the center. But um, for vintage accuracy, I have... So uh, there were times when I just left those screws out. Um, but I found that, uh, especially on a reverse belly bridge like this, they're in there for a reason. And they are pretty light and small. And they don't add that much mass. And uh, just leaning toward the vintage uh, accuracy side of that line there. Um, and so put those screws back in here. The reverse belly bridge, um, it's kind of a odd uh, bridge design, kind of in between the uh, rectangular shaped bridges um, and the later belly bridge, which has the belly on this side. The top from string tension has a tendency to do this. And so I think their first thought was to add some, uh, make the footprint of the bridge larger a larger gluing surface to combat that string tension and movement at the top. Um, since it's going like this, the belly in the front is helping this area, just adding some 
some, uh, said a larger footprint to keep the bridge glued down. But of course, the strings are right here on the back edge. There's a lot of tension on the back edge. And uh, over time, probably not much time at all, they figured out that the belly should be in the back. That's where you can add to the footprint and allow the bridge to stay glued down to the top and fight that string tension and win that battle. So that's where the screws come in because there's that tension right on this line, the back edge. The screws help to reinforce that. Um, a negative with those screws is if that glue joint on the back of the bridge does start to come up, it puts a lot of tension right on those two screw hole areas. And if, depending on what else is going on with the guitar, it can really put a lot of tension right on those points and Curtis create a lot. Uh, it can create a lot of other uh, problems, but trade-offs there. Anyhow, so there's the bridge on. Uh, I had some loose back braces. And one of the things that I found, and this, this little piece of wood that still needs to be glued to the interior. You can see this center strip on the inside of the back, which is to reinforce this glue joint here, where the, uh, you know, the center, center line of the back, the back like the top is made from a book match piece of wood a thicker piece of wood that is cut down the center and laid open like so, like the pages of a book, so that it's symmetrical as possible on either side of that center line. Um, and, you know, that's just a reinforcement on top of that. Uh, Gibsons from this period were made with this. It's just a really thin uh, piece of uh, maple. Um, and the glue that they use to glue it down just is not, I'm not sure what's going on with it, but they just curl up and fall off a lot of times. And so while gluing the, the braces that were loose there, you know, pieces of this just fell out and added to the problem. So this is a piece that goes in the interior back here uh, on the inside of the back that I got to put down yet. Well, I did glue a number of spots for that back strip still uh, giving me challenges. There are also a couple of back cracks that I have glued up and cleated here on the back side too, which have to be, um, they are glued from the outside, but the, in, and then the uh, cracks are reinforced with uh, cleats on the inside that span that crack and just reinforce it. Very similar to that bridge plate patch. Super thin, these are even thinner, 30 thousandths. Um, and uh, they are shaped on the top with a slight dome. This is, these are the, this is the TJ Thompson crack repair um, idea. Those cleats and the magnets and the calls that go with that, you know, allow you to work inside the guitar and get things lined up uh, well. So got that going. That allowed me to finally take the neck off. And uh, the first step of taking the neck off is to loosen this glue joint here where the fingerboard extension is glued onto the top of the guitar. Uh, this was kind of interesting as I used my reworked cake spatula. It's, it's super thin on this edge, bit of a knife edge. and shined up and polished so that it will slide across the top there as I'm trying to get it in between this glue joint. I'm heating this fingerboard extension from the top to loosen that glue joint. Yeah, inserting this in here. Usually you have to work your way very slowly as that heat penetrates and um, all the way up to there. This was interesting and I got to by right here, the whole thing just popped off literally with a noise like that. And uh, that's usually a good thing because A, you know, you're done quickly with that part of the job, but it can also raise concerns as why did that pop up? What was going on there? And um, I found a couple of things as to why that was going on there. You can see that this dark stuff, that's the glue that was used. And the moisture in the glue apparently 
Um, I don't think it was stained or dark like that itself. I think it just took some of the oils mm. that is in the the, the rose, the, the Brazilian rosewood itself, and allowed that to seep into the glue. You can see these very distinct uh, lines here. They do correspond to a lot of the grain lines, but there was also a uh, there was a tool used to scribe those lines into this part. Um, it, that can be a useful um, idea where you're gluing two wood surfaces together and um, you're trying to allow some small amount of room for the glue squeeze out itself so that the glue doesn't, if you clamp it really hard, it doesn't just squeeze out the edges and there's not enough glue left. It just gives some of the glue uh, some room to remain in there. Just interesting, I hadn't seen it that starkly define those lines. Um, another, so unfortunately, in cleaning this, all that glue off, I've lost most of those lines here. But another reason it popped off, you can see this area right here. If we look from the side, basically, when this was sanded, maybe with a drum, that drum went a little deep right there. So it created this little hollow. And um, that, um, and in that hollow, hmm, I can't really see those scrape those lines that were scraped in there. But anyhow, that's one of the reasons it popped off. And I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do with that little hollow because it is, it reduces the footprint here, which makes the glue gluing surface more apt to pop off. So, um, and that glue joint right there is definitely a big. A big part of the strength of this whole situation where the strings are pulling on it like so because I've uh, as you fit the neck and tilt it like this by removing material here at the heel and taking that line and making it go to a zero point this fulcrum point right here at the, at the 14th fret where the Fingerboard, the neck, and the body all meet. Um, that loosens the dovetail joint within there. So, especially on the bottom edge of this, so you have to put shims, tapered shims in there to take up that space and really make it solid. Um, when you do that process and you have those shims fit perfectly, you can string the guitar up without any glue right there. And it will hold up and give you an idea of where you're at as far as the neck angle and the setup of the instrument. But uh, I found, and I started to use that at one point, but I found that uh, no glue here, it really allowed with that string tension for the thing to move that way. And so I had a, you know, a pretty precise look at what it was gonna look, uh, end up like without the glue, with a certain saddle height and an action height and everything. And I thought, man, I've nailed this. And I took that all apart put glue in and clamped it all back up again, strung it up, and it was different because the glue here on this surface a lot, um, basically um, without any glue there, the neck tilted back this way with the string tension a little more. Not much, but just enough to make that, ooh, I have a perfect look here before I've even put the glue in of exactly what it's gonna be like when I'm done. It didn't work that way. And so I just found that this glue joint here definitely adds a lot of strength to a standard dub dovetail um, glued on neck. And one other little thought about that is um, Martin guitars and some others, the Martin style 42 and 45 have abalone all the way around the edge here. And then abalone, that meets some abalone right here that goes around the fingerboard extension. And to get that, uh, when you insert that, you of course have to make a cavity into the top that um, will accommodate that. And we've seen that depending on how that is done and how tightly that is fit. Um, again, it's kind of the same thing as not gluing this. You can weaken this area right here and allow that to move back. So. It's again, it illustrates the importance of this glue joint to me in, in the whole, it's not the only thing, but it definitely adds to the uh, 
strength of the dovetail joints. So now I'm in the process of cleaning out this dovetail cavity, uh, you know, from both sides there. I've got this side fairly clean of glue and been working on this side. You can see those dark stains there, the glue, and correspondingly cleaning this all up. I mentioned how I cleaned all the glue off there. I've cleaned it off both sides of the uh, dovetail tenon. And then I just started cleaning up this face right here. Um, on Gibson guitars, the neck is glued on to the body before the finish is put on. And this area right here, this area right there are definitely glued together. Um, on a lot of guitars, uh, like the Martin guitar, for starters, the Martin guitar has a different shaped heel. Gibsons tend to have this straight line down here with a very rectangular shape, much larger heel and heel cap. Uh, well, this doesn't have a heel cap, but just a much larger heel. Um, it makes removing the neck a challenge because you can see it pulled the 15th fret, drilled those two holes. Those two holes fit down in a small amount of space that is, there's some space between the back edge of this dovetail tenon and the cavity there. And uh, those holes give you access to that. That's where you insert the steam to um, soften the glue joints, allow you to pull the neck out. Um, it's really hard to get that steam to get into here. Um, it does a little bit, but usually what you end up with is this area down here still glued up because that steam is coming in down here and it's, that's why you have two holes. You insert the steam on one side and let it travel down and come out the other side and, and you keep switching between those two. But it really leaves this area right here difficult to remove from the, from the neck because you're, it's hard to get access to that steam there. So you have to depend on a fair amount of pressure from your neck removal setup to get it out of there. But anyhow, the same thing happened to that part of the neck removal as, as did this. I had to go out that neck removal in a couple of different stages where it was loose all the way down to here and this was still glued. And as I, you want to get a lot of steam in there to loosen that joint, but you have to be very careful of where that steam goes out. You can see there's a shine, a certain patina to the finish here and right here. It's different. That's from the steam escaping there. And try as I might, I need, I uh, did as much as I could to minimize that effect. Um, and, uh, But in that whole process, the thing that finally got the neck off was just the tension of my neck removal setup. It just went, same thing, just popped off at the end, nice and clean, which was uh, a relief because sometimes during the neck removal or remove, you know, taking apart anything, when you hear a pop and a noise, it's not always a good sign, you know, but it was in this case. So anyhow, that's where I'm at right here. So what I've just started to do recently, so I got, I love this chisel and this size right here just because um, my skills and abilities to uh, make a nice sharp chisel um, just happened to come together on that, that chisel itself and that size. But um, putting the glove on here, a little Michael Jackson action because when you're sharpening the chisel, these edges right here on the front, they get sharp too. They're not nearly as sharp as that right there, but they do get fairly sharp. And what I tend to do is hold the chisel like so to do a lot of my work. <laughs> There's a bunch of scars right there if you can't see them because I end up digging into my skin here without even knowing it. And I uh, say, dang, where's all this red stain coming from? <laughs> Anyhow, the glove helps. And so I used the, the bench and the stool and everything to uh, just set it up like this. Peghead goes on the stool and um, it allows me to get in here like so. And 
the closer I get this finger to the point, it just gives me more control. The last thing I want is to be way out here and to go zoom. You know, have this slip and or even worse, slip right into there like that nasty scar that happened to me one time. We won't talk about that in detail, but uh, anyhow, what I'm doing is uh, back cutting this uh, surface right here to, so that, and I've done most of this already. I'm just shaving little bits of material off here to clean off all the uh, old glue, get a nice fresh wood surface, but I really want it to do a little of this. I don't know if we can see this where, yeah, I can see it. I don't know if you can. There's a, uh, there's a small cup to this area here where I've less left these edges uh, untouched. So they are proud and sitting up and there's a small cup to that. So that when I do put the neck on the fit of this part of the neck to this part of the sides is really tight. And so you remove, remove 32nd of an inch or less from this area in here to allow that to be the first, the outside edges to be the first area of contact. And uh, because the next thing I'm gonna do is start changing the neck angle. To, um, yeah, because the neck is sitting too far like this. I want it to sit more like that. I'm gonna start changing the neck angle by removing some material right off the, the heel here. And I said, tapering that up. So if I've got this outside edge exposed or sitting proud, um, there's very little wood that has to come off and it's easier to be more precise like that. So the first thing that I would do is to just go in this way here. Again, you can see I'm, I'm getting control of that chisel by just having, and I'm just starting the process of changing that angle by taking a small amount of material off here. Well, it is a small amount of material, but um, in the scheme of things, the chisel actually takes quite a bit of material off in a couple of two or three passes. And here, I'm a, here I am on my second pass and really moves you ahead a lot. And I have spent some time, and I know a lot of others also spent a lot of time to use, to say, hey, this is just angles. This is just simple geometry and math with, you know, combined with knowledge of the John, call 883. John, 883, please. We'll see if that minimizes the pages. Um, it actually takes a fair amount of material off pretty quickly because most of the time, all you need to do to take off this is somewhere a little more than uh, somewhere between a 32nd and a 16th, you know, 30 thousandths to 60 thousandths material off here really moves that neck angle quite a bit. So there, I've taken that off. Now I'm gonna go back and make sure that my um, back cut is still there. And this is one of the challenges with the Gibsons is this larger squarish heel. Again, makes for a lot of material in here that needs to be removed with each step as you come closer to the angle that you want. bit there. Now I'm going to stay, start my first pass here on the sides here where I've got that edge proud and exposed and I can just take a shading off here and work my way up to that fulcrum point. I stopped well short of that fulcrum point on those first passes there. And now I'll do one of a million 
checks here where I throw the uh, slip the neck on here. You can see it slips on really easy because it's quite loose. You know that the um, removal of removal of the glue and starting this process has really loosened that up a lot. Um, and I'm just looking at the fit here. I'm looking at this fit between the sides and the cheeks of the of the uh, neck heel to get a super precise fit there. And when I look here, I see that it's there's a tight spot right there and tight right there, but there are gaps there and there. So that allows me then to go at my next pass, say, I'm gonna take some wood off there and some wood off there. I'm gonna look at the bottom here. Nice little gap there at the heel. So I know that I'm starting to change that neck angle, but I gotta continue to fit these sides. And I'm looking at the other side and it's a similar thing. There's a spot here that is very tight and another spot up here. So I'm gonna go back and, and uh, look at that. One of the challenges of the Gibson versus the Martin style necks is that on the Gibsons, this heel is comes all the way and sits flush with the back of the guitar. So how deep this neck goes into that cavity is crucial. On the Martins, there is a plastic heel cap that usually aligns with um, the binding, or if there's any purfling below that binding, you get some nice little alignment where it sits proud like this. And so you have a little more leeway. You don't have to get that exact fit to the back, you know, but um, I'll do this as many times as it takes to, to get that angle and that fit. I'm trying to maintain the fit while I change the angle. Um, again, the, the idea of calculating this all with math is definitely possible, but it's, I found it highly challenging. And the, um, the idea though is to, if you know exactly how much material you need to take off there to get the, an the desired angle that you have, you can go and lop that off all the way to the edge, you know, all the way to that, clean that up, and you should be that much closer to your end point. Uh, I found that to be uh, really challenging to uh, whatever time you save there, then getting these lines to fit perfectly, in my experience, ate up all that time you saved and you end up taking the same amount of time. And then I've always had a lot of concern about that fit. And so my approach for this is very similar to my approach to a, a lot of other parts of the uh, of the restoration repair processes, which is to uh, maintain as much control as you had and creep slowly toward that end point so that when you get to the end point of the angle being there, the fit isn't so far off that you have to like spend a bunch of time getting the fit to be right and then there's a danger of throwing off the angle you just established. And, and so I like to move towards it in small increments, small controlled in increments, which seems to be the best process for me. It's probably something that just fits my personality in some way. That gap right there is, is getting smaller and those two areas where I've, and this, two, this right here still needs to be fit better and the same right here. It's interesting that those two areas where I wanna change the fit or, have, or, have, or are fitting nice and tighter right here at the bottom of that dovetail, right there. So, Each time I take and remove some material from that outer edge, I have to think about making a corresponding move here on the interior of that to um, maintain that back cut. And when I do it to one side, 
I would also like to keep it symmetrical because in addition to maintaining that fit and increasing that angle, I want to make sure I don't get any oddities like this. So if I take a bunch up this side of the neck, theoretically it's going to move the end you know, move the neck fit like this, where it's just, the angle's going to be wrong. It's not going to be on the center line. Center line of the neck and the fingerboard have to line up very precisely with the center line of the body so that the center line of that peg head, you know, is lined up very nice. The guitar is built along that center line. That's, um, you also have to take into consideration how well these two pieces were machined on that center line at point one and how well the bridge has survived. If it, if it started on that center line and through the years with different bridge reglues, you know, did it stay on that center line? You've got to, um, that's definitely um, a consideration also. But theoretically, theoretically, if you do not touch this area, that fulcrum point, you're not changing that. And if you're putting shims in that are symmetrical, or at the very least are, Again, shifting that into the, or keeping it on the center line, it all works out. But a lot of things to keep track of right off the bat um, as you move through the process. And again, that's getting smaller. This fit is changing, but interesting enough, I, I, I just have to keep taking the material off right there where it corresponds to this little area here at the bottom of the dovetail. There you go, that's the neck reset process. I'm not going to make you guys suffer through this sort of watching paint dry uh, feeling of me taking those teeny little slivers of wood off, you know. Um, but that's what I'm going to be doing for the next little while here and until uh, I uh, can't do it anymore and have to put it aside and, and work on something else. So uh, there you go. That's what we've got in the shop for you today. Thanks for tuning in. Um, any questions or, or thoughts, send them our way. We'll try to answer them for you and uh, take care until next time. Joe Conkley in the shop. See you.